Hello, welcome back to yet another board game tutorial. Today we are talking about a game called Monumental. Right before we start the setup, I just want to mention that I did leave a link down below to a board game geek user who made a cheat sheet all condensed of like the setup and the tutorial, which I thought was really nice and helpful. So make sure you go ahead and check that out. And I also did a cinematic showcase on Monumental where for about a minute, I show the components of a board game to some cinematic movie type quality. And I hope you enjoy watching that if you haven't already. So let's start off by doing the main board setup. Here you have a little pamphlet where you can choose a bunch of different pre-constructed maps depending on how many players that you have. Today we are setting for a two player game which is going to be the very first map shown right here. But eventually once you get used to the game you can always make your own map so that's totally fine too. So the first thing you wanna do is set up all your tiles according to how the map is shown. And then next you wanna take these square tokens called barbarian tokens labeled one, two, or three. And they're gonna be different slots for you to put them on the map, depending on the layout that you chose. You wanna make sure you lay them on the map with the barbarian side showing face up and the reward face down. So make sure you randomize it. Now the next thing you put on this map are something called free tokens. Now free tokens will have a number and will also have a resource listed next to it. There are two slots for it according to this map. So you'll lay those down next, right after the barbarian tokens. Now for this map, it requires one of the three gold tokens, which we'll put right over here. And then next you wanna set up the markets according to the number of players. So since we're setting up for a two player game, you'll have two markets. So for this map, we'll put two randomized Rome tokens here and then two randomized Kathmandu tokens right next to it. Next up, these are called production tokens, which have a steel pick and a steel mallet. These will go across the entire map except for the lake tiles and except for the capital tiles. So you put one on every other tile listed. The capital tiles are the tiles where your units will be starting out. And these are the ones with a white brick layout. And then right next to the map, you'll put your gold tokens, culture tokens, and your three different types of resources, which will be red for military, blue for science, and black for production, and put that on the side of the board. Now next, I want you to grab the arrow cards. And we're gonna separate these by buildings, by wonders, and by knowledge cards. Now all of them will have a label at the top of either one, two, or three, designating which one is of course for era one, or for era two, or for era three. Separate those and then combine them all into one deck. Now the number of cards are going to differ depending on the era that you have. So for era one, you'll have five of each set of cards. For era two, the medieval era, you'll have four of each set of cards. And then for the final era, era three, you'll have four of each set of cards, but then zero, building cards. Now, as a quick side note, the game does come with three extra wonder cards, one per era. You could just pick a random one to take out at the beginning of the game when you are setting up. Now you want to shuffle each era separately and then start putting them together. So era three will be on the bottom, followed by the era card on top, and then repeat. So you put all the era two cards in there and then put the era two card on top. And then lastly, era one cards with the final era one card right on top. Now, every time you draw one of these era cards, they'll get discarded right away. Now you'll set up the basic building cards, which are all denoted with a star in the upper left hand symbol of the card. You have three types of buildings. You have the archery ranges, you have the laboratories, and you have the workshops. Now in total, you'll have 10 of each, and you can put all these face up above the development deck. Now we're gonna set up something called the development display. So remember those cards that we just shuffled with the errors one, two, and three? You're gonna draw the top six, excluding the first card, of course. And then you're gonna make a row, a single row of six cards. So this will be your development display for three or more players. If you're setting for a two player game, like we are doing now, you'll set up two rows of three cards. Each of those rows are independent. I'll explain a little more about that later. Okay, so that was the main board setup. Now let's get to the fun part, which is the player setup. So now you get to choose your civilization and there are five to choose from in the base game. You have Japan, China, Egypt, Denmark, and Greece. In this game, we'll set up for Egypt and Japan. Now to start off with your civilization, you're going to start off with a set of cultural policy cards. Now these all have unique backs depending on the type of civilization that you chose to play with. For example, here, these are Japanese, so you have these red and gold symbols here. And then they also have these archway symbols on the top left. So those are unique depending on which team you want to play with. So get your five cultural policy cards, and then you're gonna pick a color to play with. There are 14 bases in total, one big one, and the rest are all small. Now you also get one Warlord Mini along with the Warlord card. Also to mention that I am setting up for the Deluxe Edition today. If you have the base edition, I think they come with tokens instead. Now you also get five Work Camp cards, three Fort cards, three Libraries, and one unique Knowledge card. On top of this, you also will get one Mine, one Forum, and also one unique Building. So for example, for the Egyptians, you'll have the Pharaoh's Barge. And for the Japanese, you'll have the Samurai School. 
Those are both unique buildings to each civilization. So in total, you should have 15 civilization cards. Now we're gonna make a city by dealing a three by three grid of nine cards. So we'll start with the top left and go to the right. Now, if you happen to deal out a knowledge card, which are the blue cards, you're gonna put another card right on top of it. So in this case, you'll technically have 10 cards for your city. The rest of the cards will go to the right of your city, which will make up your city deck. You can also add two gold, your warlord card, and also your cultural policy cards, which will also go right next to your city. You can look at your cultural policy cards at any time during the game. Doesn't matter if these are shuffled or not. Now, first player is determined by the person who most recently visited another country, and they're going to keep the era one card. The last player, however, is going to choose which capital city that they're going to start in. So depending on whichever one that you choose, you're going to put all your minis stacked onto the tile. If you are using minis from the deluxe version, know that a couple of them won't fit, so you can just put them off to the side for now. Okay, now always the biggest question of the day, which is how do we play the game? First, we need to gain resources. We do that by activating our city. You're going to choose one complete row and one complete column and then turn them 45 degrees. Now this means that they are activated, and if you are activating knowledge cards, which are again the blue cards, these will also be activated as well. And then you gain the basic resources that are listed on the top right of each card. So you get black resources for production, red for military, and blue for science. You have to spend these this turn or else they're going to disappear. Now these are considered basic resources, and that's important because if you don't use them this turn, they're going to disappear. Now secondly, we're going to take an action now. So the thing is, with actions, you can take as many as you want, in any order you want, in any combination you want. The only restriction to this is you have to be able to pay for all of those actions before you take them. Now, if you activate any effects, you can activate them in any order of which you choose, but the effect of that card that gets activated can only be used once per turn unless the card says otherwise. And you can also look at your own discard pile at any time during the game, but only your own discard pile. Now, gold is considered the wild resource of the game, so this counts as any of the three basic resources. And now, let's go through each action one by one. There are a total of nine actions. Number one, let's say you want to upgrade your city. You can acquire development or basic building cards, and all you have to do is pay the production cost, which is listed on the bottom left corner of the card. And then you take the card and you put it face down on top of your deck. Now, if you buy a knowledge card from the development display, you're going to pay the cost in science and also place it face down on your deck as well. If you buy a wonder card from the development display, pay the cost in production only in the leftmost circle. So if I want to buy the pyramids, I'm only going to pay three production tokens total, not six. Then you take it and put it face up next to your city, and you also put a yellow cube in the leftmost circle. Now this yellow cube is called the Wonder Construction Counter. This is now stage one of the wonder that is built. Now what's also important to note is that you can only work on one wonder at a time. So if you end up getting another one, you have to choose which one you're going to keep building. Now the one that you don't keep will get removed from the game. So this leads up to action number two, which is completing a wonder. If you've already started construction on a previous wonder, you can pay the cost in the right circle and you can do this in the same turn. So when you finish it, you automatically gain those listed resources. Now again, we're not activating any kind of cards yet because activating effects are its own action. And then you're going to take the matching wonder token and put it on any province that you control, which also will include the capital tile. Now when I say control, it means if you have the most number of units on that particular province or tile. You can only have one wonder in each province or capital and Wonders will also add a plus two defense to the province that you're adding them to. If you cannot put a Wonder token anywhere because your provinces already have them, then you can't take this action to complete your Wonder. Action number three, developing a culture policy card. Remember the five cards with the unique back that we talked about earlier? For these, you can develop them by paying the cost listed in the bottom left corner of the card. But it's a little bit different here because these cost cultural tokens. So the first one that you buy will cost one token. But then if you were to buy a second one, it now costs two cultural tokens and then three cultural tokens, so on, and until you get to the final culture policy card, which will in turn cost you five culture tokens. Now, in case you're wondering where you get these cultural tokens from, you get them from conquering different provinces, but we'll talk about that later. Now, you're going to take these and put them next to your city face up. And then you immediately gain the effect that's listed with the lightning bolt shown at the bottom of the card. The effect in the middle is an ongoing effect, which will remain active until you gain another policy. So if I were to gain a second one, it goes on top and then you gain the immediate effect of the first card and the second card and then you'll get to activate the ongoing effect that is on the second card from here on out not the first card so you gain the bottom effects of both cards but you only activate the top cards ongoing effect okay so let's take a second to recap what's going on first off we need to gain resources to do so we're going to activate our city by rotating our cards 45 degrees and we're going to activate one complete row and one complete column 
And then from there, you're going to gain each of the resources that are listed on each of the cards, including the knowledge cards. Now you're going to take all those resources that you just gained and then spend them on different actions. So far, one of the actions that we talked about is to develop a city by gaining a card from the development display. In order to buy a card there, all you have to do is pay the cost in the bottom left corner, take that card and put it on top of your deck. Or if you don't want to buy a card from the development display, you can also buy a card from the basic building list, one of the three. If you happen to buy one of the grand white wonder cards, you're going to take that and put it next to your city and then pay the cost only in the bottom left circle, the left left circle. And then you're going to put a wonder construction cube, which are the yellow cubes in the bottom left circle to show that you paid for it and that you're building that wonder so far. So acquiring a card from the development display or from the basic building list, that is action number one. Action number two was to complete a wonder. You can do this on the same exact turn that you bought a wonder if you have enough resources. Now, if you want to complete a wonder, what you're gonna do is pay off the remaining cost and then you're going to activate or gain any kind of bonuses from the wonder card. And then you're gonna take the wonder card and put it on top of your city deck. Lastly, you're gonna take one of the tokens or tiles that match that wonder card and then put it in any province you control. When you do that, it's gonna give your province a plus two defense to that province. Now, action number three is to develop a culture policy card. For these, you just pay the cost in culture tokens, which you will gain from conquering different regions that we'll go over in a bit. But once you pay the cost here, you automatically gain whatever award that is listed at the very bottom of the card next to the lightning bolt symbol. And then the ongoing effect, which is listed right above it, will be active until you get another cultural policy card. And then if you gain two cultural policy cards, you gain both immediate effects, the ones next to the lightning symbol, but only the second card, which is the one that remains on top, that's the only one that has the ongoing effect that remains active. So it's kind of like a domino effect where you gain the rewards listed at the very bottom, but only the ongoing effect of the top card will be active. So to pay for those cards, we need culture tokens. That leads us to action number four, which is to conquer a province. So we started with 10 units because our two explorers actually don't count as any units at all. You can attack a province tile either adjacent to your capital or to any province that you already control by paying military resources. Now you can move one unit into the attacked province for each military resource that you pay for. Now the rule here is that you have to move into an attacked province with the number of units that's equal to the defense value of that province. So that value comes from the number that's listed on top of the tile plus any unit that is defending it. So if I wanted to conquer this tile, it would cost two units because you have zero up top with a barbarian token of two on the tile. Now you can also split units coming from any province, including your capitals, as long as they can reach through the attack province from any provinces that you control. So if I have two armies here, I can spend four military tokens to move two units from this side and then another two units from the other side. Now a couple of things to keep in mind, you can't attack a water tile and you can't attack another player's capital city. You control a province as long as you have a unit or an outpost that's on it. And you can't move your units if it ends up emptying your province and you lose control of that previous province. The only exception to this is if it's in your capital city that can remain empty. And then remember, just to reiterate, barbarian tokens also count towards the tiles defense. So if there is a barbarian with two with the tile also listed at two at the top, then that would take four military resources in order to conquer that specific tile. Now, speaking of barbarian tokens, if you end up conquering one with a token listed on it, you're going to flip it around and then choose one of the rewards that is listed at the back of the tile. You gain that reward right away and then you'll put your barbarian token face up next to your city. Okay, now remember how we set up the free town? To conquer those, you have to add the listed resource in addition to the military resource. So here it would cost two military for the tile and three production in order to conquer this free town. But just like barbarians, you gain one of the two listed rewards on the back and then put them face up in your city. Now this is how you gain culture tokens in order to develop your cultural policies. Another thing to note when you are conquering another player, make sure that their units also go back to their capital city if you are successful in defeating them. Now you can also move your warlord, this is easy. Anytime you wanna conquer a province, you can choose to move your warlord as one of your units. And if you do, you automatically gain the benefit that is listed on your warlord card. But this can only happen once per turn. Now your warlord, just like the Wonders, will also add plus two defense on any province that it's in. Now also you wanna move a bunch of your units through provinces that you already control. Action number five is to move military. Now for this, you're gonna spend one military resource per unit that you wanna move as long as you control both provinces and that they are connected. You can move as many units equal to the resources that you want to spend. So if I want to move three units from here to here, then I just spend three military and then move them all over. 
Now we've been mentioning outposts here and there, but the question is, well, where do they come from? Action number six is to construct an outpost. So if you have a province that has at least three of your units on it, you can take those three units, put them back to your capital city. This includes your warlord, by the way, and then replace them with an outpost. The maximum outposts you can have per game are two outposts at once. You can also only have one outpost per province. You also cannot move any outposts once they are built. Now these will give more defense than even your wonder cards and your warlords because they give plus three defense. There is one set of units that have been lurking around and haven't been mentioned yet. Those are your explorers. Action number seven, if you spend one military resource, you can move your explorer. Now what do explorers do? Now every turn, each of your explorers can perform one of the following two actions. If they land in a province with a market, you can look at the market tokens, pick one to keep by placing it face up in your supply, and then you put the other token back face down. You can only take one token from each market throughout the whole game. Now the other action explorers can do is to take a production token from the province that is currently in and then place it in your supply. Now any market or production tokens gained can be used now or they can be saved for later. But remember that if you gain any basic resources, better use them now before they disappear. And then also make sure that you are aware which market token that you've taken just so you remember which ones that you already have. And as a reminder, explorers are not units so they cannot be used to conquer, which in turn means you cannot control a province with an explorer. Almost all the actions done. Action number eight now is to use a card effect. So remember all the cards that we activated in our city. Now we can use any of those effects, if any, in any order. You can also activate your culture policy card if you have that as well, and or your wonder if it is completed. Now remember that these card effects aren't mandatory, so you don't have to use them if you don't want to. And that leads us to the final action, action number nine. Action number nine is to make scientific progress by using two scientific resources and then drawing the top card and activating it immediately from your city deck. Now once you resolve all those effects, that card gets immediately discarded. Now as you perform as many actions as you can, I know what you're thinking. Hold on, Tim, that was 10,000 actions. Can we get a recap here? Yes, my friend. Yes, you can. Let's summarize all nine actions really quick. So we just activated our city by column and by row, gaining all of the listed resources. Next, we start taking an action to spend all of those basic resources that we just gained. We can get a development or a basic building card by paying the cost listed on the bottom left and then putting the card face down in our deck. If we get a wonder card, we only pay the left cost in the left circle, moving the wonder next to our city with a yellow cube or the construction token on it. Number two, we can activate those wonders by paying the cost on the circle to the right of it, getting the completion bonus, and then putting that card on top of your deck. Next, we're gonna put the construction token back into the supply and then put the matching wonder token on any province that we control. Now these will give plus two defense to whichever province that you add them to. Number three, we can develop a cultural policy by paying the culture token that is appropriate at the time. So if you have one culture policy developed, that will cost one culture token. Once you start adding on more culture tokens, you activate the bottom immediate effect right away, like a domino effect, but only the top card will have the ongoing effect active. Remember that the first card costs one culture token, the second one will cost two culture tokens, and so on. Wait, hold on, how do we get these culture tokens? Good question, but you know the answer to this now and that is from conquering a province, action number four. All you have to do is have an equal number of units that you can move to that province as long as it matches the number from the barbarian tokens and from the number on top of the tile. So if I have a two listed on the barbarian token and two listed on the tile, then you need four units to move over, which in turn means you need four military resources. Remember that you can also split your units. So if you're trying to attack one tile from multiple sides, all you have to do is pay one resource per unit that you're gonna end up using and you cannot attack another province if it leaves your original province empty, unless it is your capital city. Also, you can't attack another player's capital city or the water tiles. Now, if you attack a province and it has a barbarian token on it, flip it over and pick one of the two listed rewards on the back, and then you'll place this face up in your city. You also will gain the production token if a tile has it too. And then if you attack a free token or a free city, you also have to pay for whatever's listed at that free token. So for example, if the tile listed two and your free city has a three with three production tokens on it, then you have to pay two military and three production tokens in total in order to conquer the city. But you will get the reward that's listed on the back of it just like you did for barbarian tokens. And then when you attack other players, their units will go back to their capital city tile. 
But wait, can we attack with all of our units? Yes, you can. You can attack with nine units because your explorers do not count as units. Your warlord though does count as a unit. So when they attack a province, then you also gain the effect or the ability that's listed on their warlord card. And remember that warlords also add plus two defense to the province that they are in. Number five, moving your military. If you want to move your units through regions that you already control, you just pay one military resource per unit to go from one adjacent province to another adjacent province. Okay, well, what about our outpost minis? Now for these, you just replace three units that are in any province, send them back to the capital city, and you can also use your warlord to send back as well, and you replace them with the outpost miniature. The outpost mini is different because it adds plus three defense to the province that it's in. You can only have two on the board at once, but any one province can only hold one outpost token at a time. Action number seven, our final unit is the Explorers. Again, you pay one military resource to move them to an adjacent province. It doesn't matter who controls it. Each one can perform one out of two actions. One of them is to take one market token if they are in a province that has it and then put it face up in their personal supply. The second action that they can take is to take a production token from the province that they're in and also add it to your supply. You can only take one market token from each market in the whole game. And you can also save these for later or use them now unless you gain basic resources from them, which you will have to use this turn before they disappear. Now, action number eight is to use the effects from any cards that you activated in your city, from your cultural policy, or from your wonder. Unless stated otherwise, you can only activate each card once per turn. And the last action is to make scientific progress. All you do here is spend two scientific resources in order to activate the top card from your city deck. And then that card gets discarded right away. And those are your nine actions that you can spend on your turn. Now, after you've exhausted all the resources and all the actions that you can take, we move on to phase three. Phase three is to replenish your city. So all the cards that you've activated go to the discard pile, and then you replenish all the empty slots with your deck. You always will deal them out, filling them out from left to right, starting from the top row. Again, you're gonna put knowledge cards in the back, and if you happen to deal two knowledge cards in a row, then pick one and then discard all the others. If you run out of cards, just shuffle your discard pile so it becomes your new deck. And if you happen to run out of a discard pile as well, then just leave that empty space for now. So there are gonna be some cases where your knowledge card will have nothing attached to it, but that's fine, you can just activate it by itself. Lastly, if your knowledge card somehow ends up in the discard pile, it's going to stay there. So don't shuffle them and then leave any remaining spaces in your city unfilled. You also will now replenish the display if you took any cards from it. All you do is shift the cards to the right and then fill in any empty spaces from the development display deck until it hits six for a three or more player game or until it fills a rows of three for a two player game like how we're playing now. So if you didn't take any cards from here, then you're gonna take the furthest card away from the development deck and then discard it and then again shift and then fill. You have to consider them separately. So if you took two cards from the top row, you're gonna shift and fill the top and then discard the rightmost card on the bottom row. If you didn't take any, then both the rightmost card on the top and bottom rows both get discarded and then you fill again. So endgame is triggered when the final card of the development deck has been dealt into the development display at the end of a player's turn. So play is gonna continue until the player seated to the starting player's right has gone. If the development card is put into the development display on the turn of the starting player's right, then everyone's gonna take their final turn right now. Now the game actually comes with a calendar grid that you can use to keep track of progress if you want to use it, but you tally up the points scored from the following. Knowledge cards will give you one point. Wonder cards will give you two points. Every cultural policy card that you've developed will also give you two points. And every province that you control will also give you one point. Remember, you're not gonna count explorers here since they're not units. So even if they're in a province by themselves, that's not a province that you control. In addition, you also get bonuses for the following four achievements. The player with the most knowledge gets three points. The most provinces controlled gets three points. Most wonders gets three points. And lastly, most cultural policies will also get three points. If you have a tie overall, then the most gold will win. Now, if there is a double tie, then the person with the most culture tokens wins. And if there is a triple tie, then we're gonna sit here and we're gonna play again, okay? Because there are no ties and shared victories in board games. That is illegal. It's so weird, it says that right here in the rule book. Huh, word for word. But that is a tutorial on Monumental. I hope you enjoyed it, hope you found it helpful, and hope you have a great time playing. But until then, I will see you all on the next video.